originali. Per la prima stagione di Lingue Originali, e in particolare per le puntate dedicate alla lingua inglese, Marco Piovaz ha scelto come compagno di viaggio Alan Bennett, scrittore, attore, commediografo britannico. In questo episodio, la seconda parte di un monologo dal titolo molto originale, Bad Among the Lentils, il letto tra le lenticchie. La prima parte la trovate sul canale YouTube di Caffè Italia nella playlist dedicata a lingue originali in lingua inglese. Buon ascolto. Once upon a time I had my life planned out, or half of it at any rate. I wasn't clear about the first part, but at the stroke of 50 I was all set to turn into a wonderful woman, the wife to a doctor or a vicar's wife chairman of the parish council, a pillar of the WI, a wise, witty and ultimately white-haired old lady who's always stood on her own feet until one day at the age of 80 she comes out of the country library, falls under the weight of her improving book, breaks her hip and dies peacefully, continentally and without fuss under a snowy coverlet in the cottage hospital and coming away from her funeral in a country churchyard on a bright winter's afternoon, people would say, well, she was a wonderful woman. Had this been a serious ambition, I should have seen to it. I was equipped with the skills necessary to its achievement. How to produce jam, which after reaching a good rolling boil, successfully coats the spoon how to whip up a Victoria sponge that just gives to the fingertips, how to plan, execute and carry through a successful garden fed, all weapons in the armory of any upstanding Anglican lady. But I can do none of these things. I'm even a fool at the flower arrangement. I ought to have a PhD in the subject, the number of classes I'd been to. But still my efforts show as much evidence of art as walking sticks in an umbrella stand. Actually, it's temperament. I don't have it. If you think squash is a competitive activity, try flower arrangement. On this particular morning, the rota has Miss Frobisher and Mrs Belcher down for the side aisles and I'm paired with Mrs Shrapsall to do the altar and the lectern. My honest opinion, never voiced, needless to say, is that if they were really sincere about religion, they'd forget flower arrangement altogether, invest in some permanent plastic jobs and put the money towards the current most popular famine. However, around mid-morning I wander over to the church with a few docked ear chrysanthemums. They look as if they could do with an immediate drink, so I call in at the vestry and root out a vase or two from the cupboard where Geoffrey keeps the communion wine. It's not looming very large on my horizon. I assume I am doing the altar and Mrs. Shrapsall the lectern, but when I came out of the vestry, Mrs. S. is at the altar, well embarked on her arrangement. I said, I thought I was doing the altar. She said, no, I think Mrs. Belcher will bear me out. I am down to do the altar. You are doing the lectern. Why? She smiled sweetly. Do you have any preference? The only preference I have is to shove my chrysanthemums up her nose, but instead I practice a bit of Christian forbearance and go stick them in a vase by the lectern. In the best tradition of my floral arrangements, they look like the paws of a wigwam, so I go and see if I can catch a bit of backing from Mrs. Belcher. Are you using this? I say, picking up a bit of mouldy old fern. I certainly am. I need every bit of my spirea. It gives it body. So I go over and see if Miss Frobisher has any greenery going bagging. Only she's doing some Japanese number, a vase like a test tube half filled with gravel in which she is throttling a lone carnation. So I retire to the vestry for a bit to calm my shattered nerves and when I come out ready to tackle my chrysanthemums again, Mrs. Shropsall has apparently finished and fetched the other two up to the altar to admire her handiwork. So I wander up and take a look. 
Well, it's a brown job. Beech leaves, teasels, grass, that school of thought. Mrs. Shropsall is saying, it's called Forest Murmurs. It's what I did for my highly commended at Harrogate last year. What do you think? Gert and Daisy are, of course, speechless with admiration. But when I tentatively suggest it might look a bit better if she cleared up all the bits and pieces lying around, she said, what's bits and pieces? I said, all these acorns and fir cones and what not. What's this conquering aid of? She said, leave that. The whole arrangement pivots on that. I said, pivots? When the adjudicator was commenting on my arrangement, he particularly singled out the hint I gave of the forest floor. I said, Mrs. Shrubsall, this is the altar of St. Michael and all angels. It is not the wind in the willows. Mrs. Belcher said, I think you ought to sit down. I said, I do not want to sit down. I said, it's all very well to transform the altar into something out of Bumby, but do not forget that for the vicar, the altar is his working surface. Furthermore, I added, should the vicar sink to his knees in prayer, which, since this is the altar, he is wont to do, he is quite likely to get one of these teasel things in his eye. This is not a flower arrangement. It is a booby trap, a health hazard. In fact... I say in a moment of supreme inspiration, it should be labelled Hay's Floor. Permit me to demonstrate. And I begin getting down on my knees just to prove how lethal his bloody forest murmur is. Only I must have slipped, because next thing I know I'm rolling down the altar steps and end up banging my head on the communion rail. Mrs. Shropsall, who along with every other organisation known to man has been in the St. John's Ambulance Brigade, wants me left lying down, whereas Mrs. Belcher is all for getting me onto a chair. Leave them lying down, says Mrs. Belcher, and they inhale their own vomit. It happens all the time, Veronica. Only, Muriel, says Mrs. Shropsall, when they have vomited. She hasn't vomited. No, I say, but I will if I have to listen to any more of this drivel and begin to get up. Is that blood, Veronica? says Mrs. Belcher, pointing to my head. Well, says Mrs. Shropsall, reluctant to concede to Mrs. B on any matter remotely touching medicine, it could be, I suppose. What we need is some hot sweet tea. I thought that theory had been discredited, said Mrs. Belcher. Discredited or not, it sends Miss Frobisher streaking off to find a tea bag, and also, it subsequently transpires, to telephone all and sundry in an effort to locate Geoffrey. He is in York, taking part at the usual interdenominational conference on the role of the church in a hitherto uncolonised department of life. Underfloor central heating, possibly. He comes herring back, thinking I'm at Dad's door, and finding I'm not, has nothing more constructive to offer than I take a nap. Gives the fan club the green light to invade the vicarage, making endless tea and the vicar his lunch, and, as he puts it, spoiling him rotten. Since this also licenses them to conduct a fact-finding survey of all the housekeeping arrangements or absence of the same, where does she keep the Duroglit vicar? A good time is had by all. Meanwhile, Emily Bronte is laid out on the sofa in a light doze. I come round to hear Geoffrey saying, Mrs. Shrubsall's going now, darling. I don't get up. I never even open my eyes. I just wave and say, Goodbye, Mrs. Shrubsall. Only thinking about it as I drift off again, I think I may have said, Goodbye, Mrs. Subsoil. Anyway, I meant the other. Shrub soil. When I woke up, it was dark and Jeffreys got out. I couldn't find a thing in the cupboard, so I got the car out and drove into Leeds. I sat in the shop for a bit, not saying much. Then I felt a bit wunny, and Mrs. Ramesh let me go into the back place to lie down. I must have dozed off, because when I woke up, Mr. Ramesh has come in and start taking off his clothes. I said, what are you doing? What about the shop? 
He said, do not worry about the shop. I have closed the shop. I said, it's only nine. You don't close till eleven. I do tonight, he said. I said, what's tonight? He said, a chance in a million. A turn up for the books. Will you take your clothes off, please? And I did. A lingua originali, Marco Piovaz ha letto per voi in lingua inglese. Lo ritroveremo su Caffè Italia la prossima settimana, venerdì, sempre alle ore 22. Ma Lingue Originali è in onda anche il sabato con Nadia Meroni, con la lettura in lingua tedesca, e la domenica con Barbara Marchand, per quella, in lingua francese. Vi ringraziamo per l'ascolto e vi diamo appuntamento a Lingue Originali fra sette giorni, sempre su Caffè Italia, la radio e il podcast dalla Roma Italiano, e non solo. Lingue originali